We're now going to start the second part of this course that's devoted to something of a coherent sub-theme. So the first one was entropy, which we've just um, spent quite a bit of time on. Now we're going to spend some time on using polynomials um, in combinatorics. And they turn out to be useful for a number of problems. And there's something called the polynomial method. But I think it's fair to say that it's not really, there's not really such a thing as a polynomial method. There's just uses of polynomials. And um, you can't sort of say, here are the situations where it's useful and here's how to use it in those situations. It's not quite like that. It's more that um, polynomials have shown themselves to be useful for a number of problems. And it's still a little bit mysterious uh, why they work or when they work and when they don't work. And if they don't work, is it because they're never going to work or just because we haven't yet been clever enough. And there, there are quite a few, I, I think it's well worth thinking about these proofs because um, it feels somehow as though uh, our understanding has not yet reached its final form of this method. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, or in this video, I'm going to talk about um, a result that's um, called the solution to the finite field Okay, a problem. I'll say in a minute what that is, um, which is due to Z Dvir. And uh, this is yet another example of a problem that was around for quite a long time and then an astonishingly short and simple solution to that problem. Um, but I'll start by saying what the Kakea problem is. So this is a very well known question, or at least it starts with a, a well-known um, theorem, which then uh, becomes a very interesting problem. So the theorem is connected with something called Kakea's needle problem, which is how small an area do you need for a subset of the plane in order to be able to rotate a needle that stays inside that um, set all the time? And it turns out that you can get a set of arbitrarily small measure that has that property. Um, and very roughly the way you, so that turns out to be more or less ask, is sort of more or less equivalent to the following question. How small can the measure of a set be if it contains a line segment in every single direction? So you, in each direction you have to have, and let's say a unit line segment. So you have to have a, a unit line segment in every single possible dimension, but uh, direction, but you're allowed to choose where the segment starts. So if you want to tr try to choose the starting points for these segments so as to make their union have a smaller measure as possible. So if you start them all at the same point, then obviously you're just going to fill up a whole semicircle or something like that and um, you'll get a uh, positive measure um, or a pretty big measure. But it turns out that you can get a measure zero set with that property and there's a construction that uh, I won't go into any sort of detail, but very roughly you start by taking a triangle, you split it into two, and then you sort of shift those parts so you get something like that. So you get quite a lot of overlap. So that's already improved on, I'm just considering, let's say, some segment of different of, of directions. Uh, but then you can iterate this process. So each of these two triangles, you sort of split up into two and you shift those in a clever way, and then you get a shape that's got, uh, you know, sort of, well, I won't try to draw it, but you've got sort of four bits up at the top here and the unions become a bit smaller. And you can get a sort of limiting construction that uh, ends up containing all these directions here, but has measure zero. But then attention turned to, there are other measures of, uh, or other notions of smallness. And another one is Hausdorff dimension. So this construction has Hausdorff dimension two, it doesn't matter exactly what that is, but it's the sort of thing you use for measuring dimensions of fractal sets and that sort of thing. Um, and it turns out also that the Hausdorff dimension has to has to be two. It can't be smaller than two. So you have it's it can have zero measure, but it has to have full dimension in this certain sense. Um, so then people looked at three dimensional um, Kakea sets, and by just taking a two-dimensional one and sort of producting it in a simple way with them um, and the other dimension, you can get that uh, you have certainly have subsets of R3 of measure zero that contain a line in every single direction. Um, but the question of what 
uh, what you can say about their Hausdorff dimension is still unsolved. So, uh, um, if you just do this, the obvious thing with a two dimensional construction, you'll get a set of Hausdorff dimension three. It's not known, and it is conjectured that uh, a Kakea set in three dimensions, i.e., a set that contains a line in every, in every direction, has to have dimension three, but this is not known. Um, and um, in fact, it's the, so the, Kakea, the Kakea problem is that well, the conjecture is that in every dimension, if you've got a a set that contains a line segment or a line, it turns out not to make too much difference um, in every direction, then it must have full dimension. The Hausdorff dimension must be the same as the R to the D that you're living in. Now, sometimes when you want to uh, prove a problem like that, it's nice to look at, so here we have a, a sort of sort of thing that makes this kind of question a little bit difficult is that if you just turn it into a slightly more finitary problem by looking not at lines, but tubes. Then you find that if you have a couple of tubes that uh, meet at a very small angle, then they have quite a big intersection. Whereas if you have two tubes that meet at a, a big angle, like a right angle or something like that, then they have a much smaller intersection. So here's a sort of smallish intersection, whereas here's a, a big one. And if they had a very even smaller angle, you'd have a huge intersection. and that. It's, it sort of creates technical problems when you're inside R to the N. In fact, um, more, to, more than just technical problems, it really makes, contributes to the problem being genuinely difficult. But a sort of, there's a nice situation where that doesn't happen. And that's if you take a finite field, F, let's make it uh, FP. So that's just um, the uh, integers mod P with addition and multiplication, which forms a nice field. Um, and then if I take FP to the D, then I can say what I mean by a line. I just mean a set of the form, uh, the set of X plus TY such that T equals naught one up to P minus one. And if I have two, so that's a, that's a line. So X and Y belong to FP to the D and T just belongs to FP. Uh, so two lines like that will either be parallel, uh, well, not, sorry, that's in, in the plane, but uh, they'll either not meet, or they'll meet, or they'll be the same, or they'll meet in exactly one point. So that's much nicer, that the intersections are either empty or consist of exactly one point. So it sort of felt as though that ought to produce a problem that was sort of closely related to the uh, original Kokea problem, but perhaps, easier to handle because you sort of throw away some of the technical garbage associated with solving the, the, pro the main problem. Um, and then that turned out to be hard as well. Um, but somehow for combinatorial, it's a much more appealing problem. Um, so I've already given away that this problem has been solved. Uh, what, by the way, what, what would we conjecture? Well, the conjecture is that um, in this case, that if D is fixed, and p tends to infinity, then uh, the size of a set that contains a line in every direction. So when I say a line in every direction, I mean for each y, we have a line, but we can choose x for that line. So for each line, we sort of can translate it however we like. And we try to do all those translations within fp to the d, so as to minimize the size of the union. Um, so, if A is our Kakea set, our, just our finite field Kakea set, in other words, a set that contains a line in every direction, the conjecture was that A should be of sort of pretty close to um, um, full um, dimension. And uh, so actually what we have is some constant that depends only on the dimension. So the idea is that we fix D, so that's just a constant. P tends to infinity, so it's within a constant of the size of the entire set. So just to say it again, the conjecture is if you've got a set that contains a line in every direction, in other words, for every Y, you can find some X such that all those points belong to the set, then the size of that set must be within a constant of the biggest it could possibly be, namely P to the D. And that is the theorem that Dvir proved 
using polynomials, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So how on earth do you use polynomials to prove something like this? Um, well, as I say, I don't really have a very systematic answer to that. I'm basically just going to show you the proof. But uh, one thing that, um, so the idea is that we're going to show that um, if A is small, then we can find a polynomial that has not too large degree that vanishes everywhere on A, but isn't the zero polynomial. So we've got a non-trivial polynomial of low degree that vanishes on A. That's going, to, that's going to be true for any A that has small cardinality. And once we've done that, we then want to use the fact that A contains a line in every direction to say that that polynomial that supposedly uh, vanished everywhere on A, um, because A contains a line in every direction, we get sort of dimension one, we get polynomials in one variable that um, have low degree and vanish everywhere on a line. And that um, tells us that those polynomials must be the zero polynomial. And we uh, end up getting a contradiction. So we sort of start with the, 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 that if A has small cardinality, we can find a polynomial that vanishes on A. And then using the property that A contains a line in every direction, we get a contradiction to that statement. So that's the sort of uh, the, the plan of how the proof will go. Um, so let's start with that uh, statement. So how do I find a polynomial? How do I prove that there's a, a, a polynomial of not too high degree? Um, I'm going to change my D to an N actually, because I've been thinking of it as an N and I think if I keep, if I call it a D, I'm going to keep writing N by mistake. So then that also is nice to be able to use letter D for degree if I want to. Um, so that's N fixed. The only disadvantage of n is that n doesn't feel like a fixed number, it feels like a parameter, but just to change your perspective a little bit, is p that's tending to infinity and n being fixed. So n might be something like four. Right, um, so let us, um, we're looking for um, a polynomial poly, um, in n variables, Um, of degree less than or equal to d, and it's a non-zero a non-zero polynomial of degree less than or equal to d that vanishes on a exists, so I've put it a great big exists in front. So there exists a non-zero if A is smaller than the number of monomials um, uh, sort of monic monomials uh, of degree less than or equal to d in x1 to xn. And soon we'll see that we can work out quite easily how many such monomials there are. Uh, so why is that? It's because, um, <coughs> so if a polynomial p has degree less than or equal to d, um, we can write it. as, we we'll just write it as a, as a linear combination of monomials. So we can write it as sum over all sets A, uh, I better not call it A, I've got an A, so I'll say all sets E of size less than or equal to D of um, Uh, I don't want that. I want to write. Uh, sorry, that that would be if um, my var if, had, if all my monomials can use distinct variables. I, I don't want to say that. So I want to say we'll have to write it as um, some 
I1 nearly there I1 less than or equal to um, less than or equal to ID of um, lambda I1 up to ID X I1 X I2 X ID so these uh, XIs are not necessarily distinct um, and I, or an alternative way of writing it would be um, sum a1 plus a n less than or equal to d of uh, lambda a1 up to a n x1 to the a1 xn to the a n so it's just two different ways of representing it um, but the point is that uh, these things here are the monic monomials um, of degree at most d. Uh, I should have not said d there up to i r. Let's forget this representation here. I can't, well, no, we will forget it, but I, I, I'll just sum r less than or equal to d. But this is a more convenient way of representing it, I think. So here is a monomial of degree less than or equal to d. And here's a coefficient associated with that monomial. And that gives me, um, if I add all those up, I get a polynomial of degree less than or equal to d. And um, so if we want p to vanish on a, uh, we need this thing here to be zero for all x1 up to xn in A. And um, <clears throat> so A is a subset of fp to the n. Now each one of those, so each condition is giving me for each choice of x1 up to xn in A, I've got some element of the field here. Um, and uh, when I sum over a1 plus uh, an less than or equal to d, I get an equation in lambda a1 up to an. So just to say that again, for each x1 up to xn in A, when I sum over this, when I look at this sum, this is now just a fixed element of the field. It's giving me some condition on these lambda things. It's giving me some, some coefficients applied to the lambdas. Um, and when I uh, take that sum, I've got to get zero. So I've got some linear combination of the, the lambda a1 up to a n that's zero. So each x in a gives a linear equation. Uh, the coefficients must satisfy. Um, so we can do this. As long as with a non zero solution, as long as um, number of coefficients is greater than the size of a. By just basic linear algebra. That's a feature of the polynomial method, by the way, that very often just extremely basic linear algebra enables one to prove really quite sophisticated things. Um, so now let's just think about how many of these monomials there actually are. So that's the same as saying how many sums a1 up to an are there that are less than or equal to d. And uh, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write x1, x2, up to xn. 
And I'm just going to put after each xi, I'm going to put a line for each power that I use. So if a1 equals 2, I'll stick a couple of lines here. If a2 is 0, I won't put a line. And, you know, if sort of ai equals 3, I'll put three lines after xi, and then I've got xi plus 1, and so on. So also, if I don't use all the d, if a1 plus an is less than d, uh, so supposing I use d minus 5 lines in order with, with these uh, a1 up to an, I'll stick five lines near at the beginning here. Um, so now my question is, how many ways are there of putting the lines? I've got D lines that I can put in somewhere. So I can read off from what I've drawn here um, what the monomial is. It's uh, x1 to the 2, x2 to the 1, you know, x3 to the 0, x4 to the whatever it is. I just, after each variable, I look how many lines there are. And so there's dot, dot, dot there. Um, so the number of, so I've got to have a, um, yeah, so I can put lines, I have uh, D lines that I put and N variables, N places where variables go. Uh, so I've got D plus N places where I can put either a line or a variable and the lines can go anywhere. And once I've decided where to put the lines, that tells me what the monomial is. So that tells me that the number of monomials is d plus n choose the number of places where we can put the variables, d plus n choose n. And um, so going back to what I said before, uh, that tells us that um, we can find a polynomial of degree at most d that vanishes on a if size of a is less than d plus n, choose n. So we're going to apply that uh, in particular when the case when d is p minus 1. So in particular, if the size of a is less than um, p plus n minus 1, choose n. Uh, so I'm setting d equals p minus 1, but I prefer to write it like this. Uh, then uh, we can find a non-zero polynomial of degree less than p that vanishes on a. This is the statement that we're going to use to derive a contradiction. Um, now, before we go on and uh, use the fact that A contains a line in every direction, I'm going to prove a nice little lemma about polynomials of degree less than n. Um, of degree less than p, I mean. So if p is a non-zero polynomial, in n variables over fp of degree less than p, and P, capital B, does not vanish everywhere. By the way, just in case you're thinking if it's a non-zero polynomial, of course it doesn't vanish everywhere. Just to explain what I mean by that, just consider the polynomial of one variable, namely x to the p minus x. Uh, so that, by Fermat's little theorem, is zero everywhere. So it's not the zero polynomial, but uh, it's because it's a polynomial of degree p, but 
it does vanish everywhere on FP. So we're distinguishing between being a zero polynomial in the sense of all the coefficients being zero and being a zero polynomial in the sense of taking the value zero everywhere. Those are two different things. So here we're saying that if you've got degree less than P, you can't take value zero everywhere. And this has a fairly simple inductive proof. So if uh, n equals one, this is, um, I'll just say this is a familiar result. So now we have a polynomial with uh, p roots and a polynomial with p roots by the factor theorem. Uh, if it, it's got to be of degree, if it's not the zero polynomial, it's got to be um, of degree at least p. So uh, that's just a known result from undergraduate mathematics, let's say. Uh, so now let's prove it by induction. So in general, um, we can write, so supposing our poly, yeah, we, what we'll do is we'll sort of peel off one of the variables. So we'll write p of x1 up to xn equals um, x to the p minus one, sorry, x1 to the p minus one, q p minus one, x2 up to xn, plus all the way down to uh, q0 x2 to xn. So we write it as a polynomial in x1 with coefficients in the ring sort of uh, polynomials in uh, x2 up to xn, so to speak. Um, and now, uh, for each fixed x2 up to xn, uh, this vanishes for all x1 and and has degree less than p in x1. Uh, so it's the zero polynomial. in x1. So the zero polynomial, that's what that says is, therefore, all the coefficients uh, qi x2 up to xn, remember we're fixing x2 up to xn, are zero. But that was true for each x2 up to xn. And the qi have degree at most p minus one. Uh, so then by induction, qi are all zero polynomial. So we're done. So we, we we proved by considering this as a polynomial in x1, we proved that the, the qi x2 up to xn vanish everywhere. And then we used induction to say that it must therefore be the zero polynomial. And if all these coefficients are the zero polynomial, then of course p is the zero polynomial as well. So that's that. And now um, let's basically finish off the proof, but uh, let's have a look at um, what we can say about a polynomial that vanishes on A if A contains a line in every direction, or as people say, if A is a Kakea set. So, um, now let's suppose that A contains a line in every direction. And P is a polynomial 
of degree less than p that vanishes on a. This is where we want to get, oh sorry, non-zero, it's very important all that. We want to get a contradiction. Um, and let d be the degree of p. Now, let's have a look at what we can say about p on the line. So, um, for each y, by assumption, we can find x such that, so y belongs to uh, fp to the n, and x also belongs to fp to the n, just so we know what we're talking about, such that the points uh, x plus ty for t in fp all uh, lie in a. Um, and uh, so if we think of P restricted to this line, set of X plus T Y is a polynomial, or we could think of it as a polynomial in T of degree less than P. Um, and it vanishes So it is zero polynomial. Now let's think about uh, what the coefficients of, of P are like. And in particular, I want to know what the, um, what the coefficient of T to the D uh, in this polynomial. Uh, so now let's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll finish this sentence in a moment, but let's have a little think down here. So uh, we're looking at a polynomial of x1 plus ty1 up to xn plus tyn. And that's going to be a linear combination of monomials evaluated at uh, x1 plus t1 dot 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 up to xn plus tyn. Each of those monomials has degree at most d, and some of them have degree d. If we want to pick out um, t to the d, so supposing I've got some monomial that looks like sort of x1 plus ty1 to the a1 up to uh, xn plus tyn to the an. And it, supposing this is actually a degree d term, if it's, if it's not, if a1 plus up to an is less than d, then there's no hope of getting t to the d by choosing t's from brackets. But if a1 plus an actually equals d, then I can get a t to the d, but I'm forced to pick the t to the, a t out of each bracket here to get the t to the d. So that tells me that the coefficient of t to the d is um, going to be um, p of y1 up to yn. Um, so it's going to be, it'll be a big one. So we also had a, a lambda a1 up to an. So the coefficient would be, um, well, the contribution from this monomial to the coefficient would be lambda a1 up to an um, y1 to the a1, yn to the an. So what are we getting? We're getting from each monomial that has degree d, 
we are picking out uh, basically exactly that monomial and that'll be the coefficient t. So what, what we get when we sum all those is pd of y1 up to yn where pd is the degree d part of p. So it's this, p is a linear combination of monomials. The degree d part is the linear combination of just the monomials that have degree exactly d and not the ones that have degree less than d. So this is a homogeneous polynomial of degree d. Um, but we've also seen that it's a zero polynomial. So what do we get? So uh, since um, it is zero polynomial, we get that PD of y1 up to yn equals zero for every y1 up to yn. Well, that's not quite true because in order to find a line here, I need y, it can't be a, a trivial line, so I need y not to be zero. So there's this extra qualification for every y not equal to zero. But this is a homogeneous polynomial of degree d. So um, actually, it's clearly going to be zero at zero as well. We can't have d equals zero because there'd be no chance. We can't have a sort of constant non-zero polynomial vanishing at any of these y's. So just uh, that trivial case doesn't happen. So it's a homogeneous polynomial of degree at least one. So it must vanish at zero as well. Um, so also, pd of zero equals zero. Um, and therefore, so pd is the zero polynomial. And actually we've got our contradiction. Let's just quickly see how that's a contradiction. So we initially assumed that, we can't find it now, but that P is, oh yes, I said let D be the degree of P. So if D is a degree of P, P must have a degree D part. And down here we've shown that the degree D part is the zero polynomial, and that's the contradiction. And now it only remains just to see what precisely we've proved. So what did that contradiction achieve for us? Um, it achieved for us that we can't have a non-zero polynomial of degree less than p that vanishes everywhere on a if a contains a line in every direction. Um, and so a can't have size smaller than uh, p plus n minus one choose n because if a had size smaller than that then we would be able to find such a polynomial. So we finally concluded a has size at least n plus uh, p plus n minus one choose n and let's just get some idea of how big that is. That's uh, p plus n minus one all the way down to p divided by n factorial, which is greater than or equal to p to the n over n factorial. So we've managed to prove the result we wanted to prove with our constant cn being one over n factorial. It turns out that uh, actually a better bound is known now, but um, or was discovered fairly soon afterwards. But uh, here I just want to prove that. So, for example, if n equals three, if you've got a Kakea set in um, fp cubed, it must have size at least p cubed over six. Even that is not at all straightforward to prove. If you try proving that uh, without polynomials, then let me know if you manage, because that would be a, a pretty interesting achievement. Okay. So that is result number one. And um, in the next couple of videos, uh, unless I manage to split them so that there are more videos, I will give um, proofs of another, uh, a couple more 
um, pretty interesting results that can be proved using polynomials. And in some cases are very hard to prove or uh, nobody even knows how to prove at all without using polynomials. <laughs>